Good morning, everyone. I'm Martha Zavala, president of the League of Women Voters, Pasadena area. Welcome to Thursday with the League, protecting our right to vote. Uh, before we get uh, to our program, I want to mention a bit of trivia. This is World Space Week, and in five short days, William Shatner, aka Captain Kirk, will launch into space on October 12th on board Blue Origin's new uh, Shepard spacecraft. He is 90 years young. Uh, you may wonder what's important about this event, uh, which is a great indulgence when there are so many people struggling to get the resources they need just to get by. But as a baby boomer, I'm personally inspired by the guts it must take to venture out and make history on such a grand scale and at an age when many are being told to get out of the way. Well, I'm nowhere near 90, but I don't plan to allow anyone to tell me to get out of the way and neither should you. I think you should keep plugging away at the things that are important to you because you make a difference when you take action and get off the sidelines. So, now, before we hear from our guest speaker, I want to provide a brief overview of today's program. We will spend half of our time hearing from our speaker, after which we will take time to answer questions you have. This is a really, really great topic, and I think you need to pay attention. Um, you know, I'm talking here right now, and in a few minutes, he, uh, our speaker will come on. You don't want to miss any of it. Um, and, or the opportunity to ask questions. What we want you to do is please enter your questions by clicking on the Q&A feature down at the bottom of your screen. Enter your questions as you think of them. Don't wait until the end. Um, I will be presenting the questions for a response from our speaker. Uh, be aware that some of the questions may be edited for brevity or to avoid duplicates. So your question may not sound exactly the way you phrased it, but it should be in there. We'll, we'll try our best to get as many, uh, to as many of them as possible, but we may not have time to include all your questions. So if we don't get to yours, please send it separately by email to our events uh, committee, and that's at events at lwv-pa.org. That will get, be given to you later on um, at, when we close out. You will have that email contact available. And, you know, when you look us up at lwv-pa.org, don't forget the hyphen. You don't want to end up in Pennsylvania. It's a beautiful state, but you meant to go to Pasadena area. So please, don't forget the hyphen. Uh, we will try to send uh, you an answer within the next few days, uh, depending on what kind of questions we get, if they're even answerable. So, and please uh, don't enter your question or any comments in the chat box. Uh, that is gonna be used by uh, the webinar staff just to keep things running smoothly for you. So if you have any concerns about the sound or anything else, you can type them into the Q&A and someone will try to help you out, okay? So you can uh, really pay attention to this presentation. After the Q&A, we will announce an opportunity to take action and then we'll close out our workshop. So now uh, we're really um, uh, pleased to announce that once again, Pasadena Media is recording our presentation and we'll be posting it on our video YouTube channel uh, for later viewing, because this is really an important topic. Now to get to the reason why you're joining us this morning, we're very excited uh, to present this relevant topic about the current status of our uh, American democracy. Uh, today, we will hear from Dr. J. Morgan Kauser, Professor Emeritus of History and Social Science at Caltech. And he'll show us how the voter suppression tactics we see today are uh, the result of a decades long assault on our right to vote. And here to welcome him is Hester Bell, a highly active member of our events committee. Hester, please introduce yourself and Dr. Kauser. Good morning. Thank you for joining this presentation on voting rights. 
The events committee of League of Women Voters Pasadena area supports the advocacy and educational missions of the league by providing organization and logistics for Thursday at the League, League at Night, and public information forums. The V in League of Women Voters is the most important part of our name. We are about registering voters, educating voters, encouraging voter participation and voter turnout. But across the country, voting rights are and have been under attack. Today, we will learn more about the history of voter suppression. Dr. Morgan Kauser has dedicated his career to the study of minority voting rights. He taught history at Caltech for 51 years, earning numerous teaching awards. Professor Kauser has consulted in over 50 state and federal voting rights cases, including four in California. His work has covered cases involving voter ID laws, restoration of voting rights for people who have served sentences for felonies, and redistricting of state and congressional voting districts. Professor Kauser is currently working on a voter suppression case in Florida. We are fortunate to welcome Professor Morgan Kauser to League of Women Voters Pasadena area. Thank you, Dr. Kauser. Hello. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, although I guess you can't see me right now. I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, um, I have mixed feelings about um, I have mixed feelings about this um, the celebrity of this topic at this particular moment. Um, on the one hand, I'm very happy to have uh, people interested in something that I've been working on for so long. Uh, on the other hand, it's uh, tragic that they have to be so interested in it. I thought when I started uh, working on this topic um, for my doctoral dissertation and then started testifying uh, somewhat later that uh, this would be over, I would be able to go on to something else. But uh, unfortunately, it's more fraught than ever. Um, so uh, what I want to do today is what I want to leave you with is uh, several things. The first and most important thing is that the voter suppression laws that you see and the activity in state legislatures all over the country that has been so rife since, uh, since January is because of the Supreme Court. Um, and the focus uh, overwhelmingly should be on what the Supreme Court has done and what uh, Congress uh, may have the opportunity to um, reverse. Um, the second thing is that uh, there have the history that may, and the, and the current events that may uh, appear in uh, debate over the subject um, is misleading uh, because it does not take into account the whole history of uh, the voting rights cases and it distorts um, the trends. In particular, uh, you should be skeptical of arguments that say we don't need the Voting Rights Act anymore because there aren't very many voting rights infractions. Um, so I hope that you come away uh, with um, an understanding of what has happened and that it leads you to um, what should be done. Okay, so here is uh, the first slide. And all right, done. Um, uh, Professor Kauser, oh, if yeah. you go to slideshow, start slideshow. Right. That's what. Yeah, I know. It's not okay, always. Here we are. Okay. 
Um, why is there a crisis? It's because of two Supreme Court decisions. One is Shelby County versus Holder in 2013. Uh, and I will describe that in a, in a minute. And the other is the Bernovich case. Um, Bernovich versus Democratic National Committee decided last June. Um, and we have seen as a result of, of these two cases, I think, uh, the voter suppression laws that are all over everywhere and you know, no doubt need about, know about. Let me review uh, quickly things that probably most members of the League of Women Voters are very well aware of. So this is just a, uh, an easy review. Um, the Voting Rights Act, the most important sections of the Voting Rights Act for these purposes are three. Section five, which requires pre-clearance by the District of District Court of the District of Columbia or the Department of Justice, most often the Department of Justice. Um, it was set up in 1965. Uh, the rationale was that in previous cases that the Justice Department had brought from 1957 through 1965, they would often bring a case and then there would be a change in either the law or the way that the law was administered, such that uh, when Blacks tried to register in Macon County, Alabama, for example, where a, a couple of the leading cases came from, uh, Macon County is where Tuskegee Institute is, and it was the it had the highest proportion of Black citizens in the United States of any county in the country in 1960. Uh, when a lawsuit was brought there uh, about the registration of voters using the literacy test, they uh, all the registrars just resigned, and uh, so there was nobody to sue. Uh, and then when there was somebody to sue, they changed the law. And the preclearance um, mechanism was an attempt to get around uh, that problem in, uh, in such jurisdictions. And it was brought to the District Court of District of Columbia uh, because it was clear that the Southern judges who had been appointed um, under segregation um, uh, mores uh, were not going to decide fairly. They would take cases, make them last for a long period of time, or uh, make decisions that were overturned uh, later, etc. So the preclearance in 1965 was set up uh, to cover to cover certain jurisdictions, mostly in the deep south. Seven states were wholly covered or partially covered at that point. In 1975, it was extended to include what are called language minorities. Language minorities were primarily uh, Latinos, but also Asian Americans and Native Americans. And this brought Texas, Arizona, and Alaska into uh, cover the coverage scheme. So every time a local jurisdiction or a state uh, tried to change a voting regulation or law, they couldn't put that into effect until the Justice Department of the DC District Court uh, said that uh, this would not have either the, did not have the intent and would not have the effect of um, discriminating on the basis of race. Uh, this is particularly important because it put the burden of proof on the jurisdiction, not on the challengers. Uh, it made them justi justify uh, the law as non-discriminatory rather than the other way around. So it uh, made it easier for people who were contending that the right to vote had been taken away to win than if they had had the burden of proof and had to prove uh, positively that there had been discrimination either in effect or intent. Uh, section four set out the coverage scheme and it um, was an attempt to say, where are the jurisdictions where we're most likely to see um, infractions? And uh, it made particular ones covered. There were four counties in California that were covered uh, because California had a literacy test and there were four counties where the uh, turnout 
in 1972 uh, was relative, was under 50 percent. And so they got covered. There were three counties in New York. There were um, some counties in uh, the Dakotas uh, and, and so on, but mostly it was the Deep South. Um, Section two of the Voting Rights Act, which is still in effect, though hampered by the Brnovich decision, uh, applies all across the country. And in section two, the burden of proof is on the plaintiffs. Uh, they have to file cases. They are often very expensive to litigate. Um, they take, they can take a long time, uh, a couple of three years at, at some times. The challenge to Texas redistricting under section two in 2011 wasn't finally decided until 2017. And in the 1990s, the section two challenges to redistricting in North Carolina went on for the whole decade. Um, so uh, that's a brief uh, memory of, uh, a brief reminder of what the Voting Rights Act is about. Um, section four of the Voting Rights Act was extended in 1970, 1975, 1982, and 2006. And in 2006, uh, we should remember that the Voting Rights Act was still very popular. And it was passed unanimously in the Senate, 98 to nothing, and close to unanimously in the House, uh, House the Undays. There was a challenge to immediately, or almost immediately, to uh, the extension of Section 5 uh, by a former uh, Thomas law clerk. Uh, it was litigated in um, the Northwest Austin versus uh, municipal Utility District Number One versus Holder in 2009, and um, the opinion um, sustained Section Five on a technicality. You're saying it sustained Section Four under a, on a technicality, um, but it, it included a warning by Chief Justice Roberts um, saying that the Voting Rights Act quote, imposes current burdens and must be justified by current needs. A departure from the fundamental principle of equal state sovereignty requires a showing that a statute's disparate geographic coverage is sufficiently related to the problem of targets. Um, there was an assertion by the Chief Justice that the evil that Section 5 is meant to address may no longer be concentrated in the jurisdiction singled out for preclearance. The statute's coverage formula is based on data that is now more than 35 years old, and there is considerable evidence that it fails to account for current political conditions. The act's preclearance requ requirements and its coverage formula raise serious constitutional questions under uh, a particular case in 1998. Um, it was at this point that I began to create a database of all voting rights cases and objections and settlements uh, in the past. And nobody had ever done that um, in, in, in like completeness and I've been working on it for 12 years. Um, I presented some results from it in testimony before the House Judiciary Committee in 2019. I thought I would testify again uh, this year, but that has not worked out at least so far. So that's Northwest Austin. Uh, Congress was unable to do anything in the four years uh, subsequent. And in 2013, uh, Shelby County versus Holder was handed down, same 5-4 majority as in Northwest Austin. Uh, Chief Justice again writing the opinion of the court. Uh, he slapped Congress down saying that Congress did not use the record to compile the shape of coverage formula grounded in current condition. It failed to narrow the scope of the coverage formula. Congress neglected to determine how that discrimination in cover jurisdictions compares to di discrimination in jurisdictions in states unburdened by coverage. Formula was outmoded. Its relation to the problems of vote dilution was purely fortuitous. Please remember that word, fortuitous. We'll see if that holds. Um, the Brnovich case. Um, is a case decided last June. Uh, it was from Arizona. It concerned two provisions 
uh, one of which prevented the counting of uh, any choices on a ballot cast in the wrong precinct. So if you go to the wrong precinct and uh, you cast your ballot as a provisional ballot because they don't have your name on that precinct list, uh, the question is whether your choices for non-precinct specific um, ballot choices are uh, to be counted or not. Arizona said no. Uh, challengers said uh, that they should count. Uh, it's, uh, it's irrelevant where your precinct is if you're voting for the Senate or the governorship or the presidency and so on. So is that uh, an equal protection violation or not? Um, the Ninth Circuit ruled there was an equal protection violation, the Supreme Court overturned that. Um, ballot collection, that was what was particularly at issue in Arizona was ballot collection on Native American reservations. Um, in some of the quite large um, Indian reservations in Arizona, uh, which are, there are more Indian reservations in uh, Arizona, and they cover a larger area than in any other state, I think. Um, anyway, in a lot of them, there are no personal, there's no personal mail, uh, which is carried around to put in everybody's mailboxes. Uh, to get your mail, if you're on one of these reservations, you often have to drive 40, 50 miles to get it. And uh, your ballot is not necessarily delivered to you if you apply for a vote by mail ballot, which anybody can do in Arizona. Uh, there's no there's no excuse absentee uh, voting in, in Arizona. So the question was whether somebody, uh, say a tribal mem officer or something like that, can go around and collect the ballots and take them to a central post office. And Arizona banned that practice. Um, that was challenged. The Ninth Circuit said that that was that the law was unconstitutional. Um, in Brnovich, the Supreme Court offered five guideposts. Now, they just made those up. They don't come from uh, a congressional deliberations. They don't come from the terms of a congressional report or uh, a congressional law. These are just five things that Justice Kennedy, uh, sorry, that Justice Alito, um, who wrote the opinion uh, for a 6-3 uh, court, uh, decided were good things uh, so one of them is the size of the burden. How hard is it to um, get to vote under this uh, under this this legal regulation? And he decided it wasn't too hard um, under either of these provisions. Whether the rule has a long pedigree or is in widespread use in the United States, especially whether it was standard practice in 1982. The sort of grandfathered in practices from 1982, which uh, doesn't fit the renewal of the of Section 2 in 1982, um, which I can talk about later if you want to ask me questions about that. The size of the disparities and impacts on different racial and ethnic groups. If it's only a few percentage of uh, Blacks or Native Americans or Latinos uh, get disfranchised with this, maybe that's okay. Um, that does not sound like equal protection of the laws uh, to me, but the Supreme Court is the Supreme Court and they get to say whatever they want to. Um, are there other opportunities to vote? Could you go and drive your 40 miles and stay, uh, stand in line? Uh, you could. Um, is that a burden? Well, <clears throat> maybe not too much. The strength of the state interests, including this vague interest in public confidence in the fairness of elections. Uh, there has been a lot of talk about that, usually in terms of voter integrity uh, in the discussions that have been taking place this year. Okay, uh, remember the word fortuitous that the Chief Justice used in talking about the coverage scheme uh, in the Voting Rights Act, uh, Section 5. Here are all of the cases that are in my database, over 4,300 of them. Uh, here are the states that they come from. And if you look at the, um, the graph, there are a lot of states and 
this is not big enough to capture all 50 states uh, with names here, but there really are 50 states here. The vast majority of states have very few infractions. Compare, for example, Texas with over a thousand. So about a quarter of all infractions have been from, from Texas. If you look at the states that are wholly or partially covered, they're below the line here. And all of the states that are wholly or partially covered, except Alaska, fall below this line. And none of the states which are not covered or partially covered fall above this line. Uh, to uh, focus in on just the states that are uh, covered and below the line, uh, that's what they look like from um, South Dakota, California covered, uh, only four counties covered still a lot of cases, uh, relative lot of cases, uh, and so on through South Carolina, Louisiana, Mississippi, Georgia, Alabama, and finally Texas. Fortuitous? Well, if it was fortuitous, uh, Congress hit the chances very well. If you had a stockbroker who could uh, hit, hit, make uh, a positive uh, suggestion 93% of the time, because 93% of all of these infractions fall in covered jurisdictions, uh, you would be a multimillionaire at, uh, with only a small investment. Um, if you look at the discriminatory uh, events by state and you divide the uh, period into uh, two different, two sub-periods. Sub One before the big change in 1981, starting with the first uh, Civil Rights Act passed in the modern era, the 1957 Civil Rights Act. And then from 1981 through 2005, because there was a big uh, renewal of Voting Rights Act in 2006. Divide those in two. What you find is that the infractions were not all in the first half of the period. In fact, they were more likely to come in the second half of the period. Uh, look at Texas, for example. The blue line is infractions in Texas, proven uh, violations of the Voting Rights Act or the 14th and 15th Amendments uh, from 1957 through 1981. That's the blue line. If you look at the red line above it, uh, that goes out to a little over 800, uh, that is infractions from 1982 to 2005. So uh, the infractions uh, kept going and the uh, coverage formula actually fit better uh, the later in the period you got. Um, if you like maps, um, this goes through only 2014, but it shows by county the number of uh, cases, et cetera, in each county. Uh, and if you look at that, you see that the vast majority of them come from the covered jurisdictions in the South, uh, the Deep South across the Black Belt area in Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, into East Texas. Um, and a lot of them in Texas, a few in California. Uh, in this particular map, I included things in the California Voting Rights Act. Uh, in, in this map, uh, I excluded them from the uh, graphs that you saw before. There are some uh, infractions from New York City. Those are all polling place changes that took place in 2001. Um, if you want to see what Congress had seen in 2006 as it was extending Section 5, the final time before Shelby County versus Holder, think of what you would have, would have seen in voting rights infractions if you had been uh, sitting in the Northern United States. Okay, we'll just twirl the map. This is what you would have seen. This is a point of view of where the voting rights cases are if you were a Northern member of Congress or Senator. 
uh, it would have looked like everything is in the south or the southwest, uh, and it would look like the coverage scheme that had been set up in 1965 uh, had fit extremely well. Um, what kinds of infractions are we talking about? What uh, things have been challenged successfully and unsuccessfully? Um, these are the kinds of voting rights laws that were challenged. Uh, at large, the most um, often challenged and the most successfully challenged uh, infractions were from at large elections. The blue part of these, uh, this, these bars is successful challenges. The uh, orange part is uh, cases that minorities lost. So more minority vote dilution cases were cases uh, charging that at large elections had, were against the Voting Rights Act or unconstitutional. There are some provisions that are usually used in at-large elections. A majority vote requirement. Uh, you have to get a majority to win when there's a runoff. Numbered posts. You're voting for uh, city council seat number one and everybody in the um, whole city votes uh, for that, even though sometimes uh, there's a residency requirement and you have to live in a particular uh, part of the jurisdiction to run. Staggered terms. Uh, if all of the seats, all the seats of the Pasadena City Council to seven members were up at once and you had at-large elections uh, without numbered posts, then a minority would be able to vote for uh, all of, uh, would be able to elect a candidate more likely than if you had a majority vote requirement or you had uh, districts. Uh, districts in Pasadena were required uh, by a 1979 uh, referendum, which was a result of a section two case that had been brought against Pasadena. And Pasadena, instead of litigating the case all the way, uh, there was a referendum and they adopted uh, district election. So more cases uh, were vote dilution cases or call vote dilution cases, cases that uh, where somebody is not denied the right to vote altogether, but when you aggregate the votes, it makes it harder for uh, minorities, political minorities, uh, religious minorities, racial minorities, whatever minorities to win. Those are called vote dilution cases. Uh, redistricting cases we're familiar with, there are actually fewer redistricting cases than there were, than there have been at large election cases. Although people often think of the Voting Rights Act as if it's all redistricting cases. There are a bunch of cases on annexation uh, and they were quite successful. Um, in an area, a uh, city, for example, uh, was growingly uh, black uh, or Latino. Sometimes the local um, city council would vote to annex a, a white area, uh, for example, to make sure that Richmond, Virginia, for example, continued to have a white majority when it was uh, threatened, as the city council members thought, with a black majority. Uh, and so they annexed white areas. That was overturned by the Supreme Court of Richmond uh, and it's been overturned by the courts in other places. Um, polling place violations, if you change the polling place, one of the most egregious ones was that they changed the polling place for a black area in one place to a, um, a country club, a whites only country club where so that uh, black people who when wanted to vote at a local their local precinct were forced to go to a whites only country club. Uh, I think they were allowed in for that purpose, um, no other purpose, uh, but the, the court overthrew that. Uh, language minority cases, um, in California now we print ballots and election materials in uh, approximately 10 languages and uh, maybe even more in Los Angeles County. 
but in lots of places, they did not print um, ballots and election materials, even in Spanish. And in areas uh, like Florida, uh, where you've got large uh, immigration, often uh, in central Florida, of Puerto Ricans who are citizens when they uh, come to the United States, uh, but their primary language is, uh, uh, is Spanish. If there are no language materials in Spanish, they're disfranchised in effect. So those have gotten overturned. There are other kinds of vote denial cases. Uh, there are voter ID cases. There's felony disfranchisement cases. If you look here, there's only one felony disfranchisement case that was actually uh, successful for minorities. Uh, that's the first case that I ever testified in. Um, and it got decided by the US Supreme Court in 1985. Um, I testified in others, uh, most recent in 2020. Um, there are other vote denial cases involving a lot of vote suppression measures. And there are other cases where uh, it's, they don't fall into any of these categories. Um, so they're relatively important. Um, here are the cases that are um, over time. So you look, start in 1958, we go to 2020. Uh, the blue line at the bottom is state level cases. There, were, there have always been some state level cases. Um, some years there were none, but almost always some. Uh, but it's, they don't change very much. What is shifting? is the local level cases. And if you look at the gray line, you will see that the vast majority of voting rights cases are local. Um, the famous saying uh, that all politics is local, that's not true, uh, it's increasingly untrue, but certainly all voting rights uh, act cases, uh, the statement that all voting rights act cases are local is much more nearly true than um, all cases are local. Um, nonetheless, you see uh, the, a particular set of patterns in the cases. And uh, one of the things that you ought to think of as uh, good students immediately is, why do you get uh, the particular uh, peaks and valleys that you do? It looks like there's some temporal pattern. You get a peak of, in the... Uh, in the beginning of things, you get a peak uh, before 1965, then you get a peak in about 1970, you get another peak uh, a bit later until 1975, you get more peaks in here, then there's this huge valley, you get some more peaks here, and then there's a trailing off entirely. So if you look at the end of this, in terms of local cases, there are more successful state cases in 2020 than there are local cases, and the local cases have really gone down quite considerably. Okay, this is a strange graph and it's strange that I would even present it, but there's a point to it. Um, this looks at successful voting rights cases. So this is all of them, not only state, but local as well. And it starts in 1900 and uh, the most important thing that you should note, and if you're students, you unquestionably noted this, is that from 1900 to 1960, there are almost no successful voting rights cases. Why did I put this in? The point is uh, simple. And uh, if this were a, a normal Caltech class, I would have said, okay, raise your hand. Tell me why you think this is the, the case. Um, Almost no, none of you would think that voting discrimination uh, in the South, particularly, but voting discrimination in general, had been lower from 1900 to 1960 than afterwards. So why is the level flat? Why is the level almost zero in, in most years? Because there was no legal way to challenge it. So. The cases that you see are a function of two separate things. One is the amount of uh, discrimination that occurs. But as this graph points out uh, most dramatically, 
The second is what legal opportunities do you have to challenge things? And it's the legal opportunities that uh, will be responsible for a lot of the action in the cases that you see. Okay, this goes back to uh, the uh, covered jurisdictions and non-covered jurisdictions. You have seen the covered jurisdictions and non-covered jurisdictions in the line graphs that I showed uh, close to the beginning. And you see that the non-covered jurisdictions uh, have much less, uh, much fewer, many fewer uh, cases than the covered jurisdictions. The covered jurisdictions are the orange line above. Uh, the Chief Justice um, said that the lines, that the cover scheme was fortuitous, uh, but it doesn't look fortuitous here. Uh, and it didn't look fortuitous in the maps or the graphs that you've seen before. Uh, it's not that there are a whole lot more cases in the uh, non-covered jurisdictions, is that there are fewer cases in the covered jurisdictions. Um, and you ought to have, uh, by this point, <clears throat> considerable questions uh, about why you've got this particular pattern and um, peaks and valleys in the covered jurisdictions over time. And we're about to see. Um, but before we see, I want to add one more line. The gray line here is the California Voting Rights Act. That's separate from the Federal Voting Rights Act. It was passed in 2002. It real, really went into effect in 2007 after uh, appeals to the challenge to the constitutionality of uh, the California Voting Rights Act in the case called Sanchez versus Modesto, which I testified in. And uh, the thing that ought to impress you here is that there are more cases in California after 2007 than there are in the whole rest of the United States under the Voting Rights Act. Only four cases in the CDRA have gone to trial. I was a chief expert witness in all four. We won all four at the, uh, at the trial court level. Um, one case is now under appeal. It's before the California Supreme Court. Hasn't been argued yet, um, but uh, it will be, I think it will, the CDRA will be sustained. But at least 453 local jurisdictions have changed their method of election from at large, mo almost all to districts, a couple to um, some sort of proportional representation or rank choice systems. But this, under the CBRA makes it relatively easier for plaintiffs to win. There are fewer things that you have to do to present a CBRA case than a Voting Rights Act Section 2 case. Uh, what this should show you is that there is still racial discrimination in voting, but in order to see it, you have to have a vehicle, a telescope, a microscope, uh, a pair of glasses that allows you to see what's there. In California, and with the CVRA, we've been able to see what's there. In the country as a whole, uh, as the next slide will make clear, uh, the Supreme Court has shut our eyes, closed off our microscopes, telescopes, glasses, so that we can't see the discrimination that was there. Here is the most important graph in the whole uh, talk. This is an attempt to give you an idea of why the peaks and valleys are like they were. Uh, and it looks at particularly important cases or particularly important actions by Congress. In 1969, the Supreme Court just decided a case called Allen versus Board of Elections. Um, it basically came from Mississippi. There's a consolidation of cases from Virginia and Mississippi, but the most important ones from Mississippi. Um, in, in Mississippi, once Blacks were able to flood into the electorate uh, in, after 1965, and Black voter registration went from 7% in 1965 
to uh, high 60s in, by 1967, 68. The state legislature immediately passed a series of laws which did uh, several things. It took systems which had been elected by districts and made them elected at large. It consolidated black majority counties with white majority counties to make white majority districts. It took uh, offices that had been elected and turned them into elect uh, offices that were appointed by the governor. The governor would appoint all white officials to uh, state schools board, uh, state, and sorry, to local uh, school boards or local school superintendents. Um, so that blacks could vote in Mississippi, uh, but the way that their votes were aggregated meant that they had been effectively disfranchised. Allen uh, settled the question about whether those kinds of vote dilution laws at large elections, uh, et cetera, could be challenged under Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. And it decided that they could be. And what happened was that there were a lot more challenges. There were challenges under Section 5, and there were challenges also under Section 2. And the number of cases went up uh, pretty spectacularly. In 1976, the Supreme Court made a decision called Beer versus United States. Uh, again, it's a Section 5 case. And the question was whether um, a uh, decision that a uh, voting rights uh, change had the effect of, uh, had a discriminatory effect, meant that it had to change things for the worse compared to the way that they were. Uh, So-called retroactive uh, changes. The, the changes called caused a regression. Uh, here, the issue was in New Orleans. Uh, there had been one city council district that was majority black, uh, seven city council districts. In 1970, they, uh, 71, they reapportioned. Uh, there was an effort to draw a second black majority district. Uh, was the county, the parish was about 30 to 40% black, um, but uh, the city council refused to do so. Uh, they got sued and the Supreme Court said, well, so long as you don't go from one to zero, uh, there is no infraction of, of section five. Um, that a discriminatory effect meant that you had to retrogress, you had to be worse off than you had been before, not that it had an effect which was racially discriminatory. So the 1982 amendments uh, were a response to another case, which I won't describe right now because I'm probably running out of time. Um, but the 1982 amendments by Congress made it easier to win Section 2 cases. And the number of Section 2 cases skyrocketed dramatically, uh, tripled, quadrupled almost uh, in a very few years. In 1986, the 1982 amendments were uh, interpreted and they were interpreted in a way that was favorable to minority plaintiffs. And again, you get a jump in the number of cases. Uh, this jump here is the number of, uh, of uh, redistricting cases that came as a result of the very favorable uh, Jingles decision in 1986. Uh, so there were a lot of cases that were challenges either under section five or section two to voting rights uh, infractions on redistricting. So a lot of cases in the early 1990s. Then Shaw versus Reno in 1993, uh, which said that if uh, North Carolina tried to draw a second majority black district so that they could elect um, a black representative to Congress uh, for the first time since uh, 19, I'm sorry, since 1899. And they, uh, they drew a second majority district, uh, majority black district that was overthrown by the Supreme Court. And you see this huge decline in the number of cases uh, that minorities won. 
and there is a similar decline in the number of cases that they brought. There was some increase uh, after uh, the redistricting of 2000. Um, there was another case uh, in 2000 uh, called Bozier Parish it's from Louisiana, uh, and that had an effect of uh, making it harder to win cases, and so there would be fewer cases brought as well. Uh, it's a larger effect than, um, than it, uh, people thought at the time, but it's, it's the bunch of cases here. There were a whole series of so-called racial gerrymandering cases decided here, and in general, people uh, in the voting rights community uh, seem to have made the decision uh, that it was going to be too hard to win cases, so they, they, should, they couldn't bring them, and certainly the Justice Department was less likely to uh, use, to make objections uh, to uh, particular uh, laws or procedures uh, after Shaw versus Reno. Shelby County versus Holder takes place in 2003, but the cases have already dropped considerably at the time that Shelby was voted, was brought, and they did not increase after Shelby. They continued to be way down. Uh, the gray line, again, is the California Voting Rights Act. Um, California Voting Rights Act is really the only thing that's keeping voting rights uh, going in terms of major victories over time um, since 2007. There are relatively few cases that are won um, in uh, the rest of the United States, particularly if you compare it to the earlier times. So what you should draw from this is that the Supreme Court uh, affects not only who wins and loses in a particular case, but the record on which one would decide whether the Voting Rights Act should be extended or not. And as in every time where there was a very favorable decision by the Supreme Court, you get more cases, you find more of the discrimination that's actually out there. Similarly, when you see unfavorable decisions, you are able to envision, to see less of the discrimination that is actually out there. The Supreme Court has the right, in effect, to remake reality and then the Supreme Court can react to that. It made it more difficult to win cases in Shaw, in Bossier II, and in uh, similar cases. And then in 2013, it can say, gosh, we see hardly any cases and uh, the voting rights problem must have gone away. Well, it hasn't. Um, and it's the Supreme Court which creates its own reality. Um, what are the laws uh, that uh, are currently at, at issue? Um, I just discussed these very quickly. I'll just leave these up on the, on, on the screen uh, and not discuss all the provisions. Uh, but the Georgia law uh, may, made it harder to vote by mail, even though no excuse uh, absentee Ballots are still legal uh, in, uh, in Georgia. Uh, it made it harder to use drop boxes. They are very much more limited. Uh, the key thing uh, here to see is that they shrunk the number of drop boxes, which can possibly be uh, set up in Metro Atlanta, which is three counties uh, from 111 to 23. So you have to go a lot farther to get to a drop box. Um, they penalized civic, civic organizations like the League of Women Voters. Uh, if they send out voting by mail applications to people who have already requested one, there's a fine of $1,000 for every one that you send out. So if the League wants to send out applications to somebody, they have to check whether an application has been sent out already. And if somehow they make a mistake on this, it wasn't posted right, 
uh, et cetera, they can be filed, fined $1,000 a shot for every uh, mistake they make. Uh, and then of course you can be fined $1,000 for handing out food or water to people within 150 feet of the poles, um, similar sorts of uh, similar uh, regulation in, in Florida. Um, it's often pretty hot in, uh, in August in the primaries and even in November in the general elections uh, or it's raining or something, uh, but you can't as a civic organization, even if you're not saying, okay, vote for candidate X uh, because she's uh, a wonderful candidate, uh, a great mother and uh, patriotic and all that sort of stuff. You can't say anything like that anyway. But even if you say, do you want uh, a cup of water? Do you want a slice of pizza uh, to make it possible for you to stand in this terrible weather? Uh, you can't say that. Uh, most threatening, uh, but hardest to figure out what's gonna happen about it is essentially legislative control of state and local election boards. Uh, there's a challenge to the Fulton County Board that's uh, happening now and is probably going to be even worse after the next election. They may take over the state legislature, may take over the uh, local board. They are going to take over the, a lot of Secretary of State's functions because they didn't like what Brad Raffensperger did in counting the uh, electoral votes. Um, so this is uh, a terrible provision and it is potentially quite threatening. Uh, Florida, uh, similar sorts of things. There are, I know this case intimately since I'm working in it, uh, very arcane things about signature matches. The most paradoxical thing about signature matches here is, and, and voter identifications that are required for applying for an absentee ballot uh, or sending in your voter by mail. Um, is that they ask for uh, to to match identifications that the local uh, superintendents of elections may not have on uh, on record, and so it may be that up to two million people may be disfranchised because there can't be a match between uh, the driver's license or the uh, Florida State Identification Card, the last four digits of the Social Security number, because the superintendent of elections don't have those on record for a particular person. And as a consequence, they can't match them. If they can't match them, the person can't get a vote by mail ballot or they can't get that counted. Uh, it's uh, very, very, very strange sorts of provisions. Um, in, uh, in Texas, um, they go so far as to make it a felony offense for officials to distribute applications for absentee ballots or to give money to organizations to do so. So you can't, uh, the, the Harris County, that's Houston uh, board can't uh, give the League of Women Voters uh, a subsidy to distribute applications for absentee ballots. Now, remember that in Texas, you have to be over 65 or uh, disabled or out of town to get a vote by mail. It can't be distributed to everybody. So you can't even uh, distribute the absentee ballots uh, to people who are disabled or they're over 65. They're always going to get an absentee ballot. That's probably the only way they're going to be able to vote or likely the only way that they will uh, want to vote. But you can't distribute the absentee ballots for them and they can't be on any sort of permanent list. Um, this um, looks at uh, a current gerrymander plan to, uh, if you wanna see uh, what Texas is doing, this comes from a graph of the New York Times article. Uh, this is the current, um, the top part of the graph is the current congressional districts these districts uh, were for Biden, uh, mostly over 30% for Biden in very packed Democratic districts. Uh, these are poor Trump 
40% or more in very packed Republican districts. But there's some in the middle, uh, particularly there's some between 5% uh, percent for Biden and 5% uh, for uh, Trump. If you look at the proposed districts, what you see is uh, they pack more Democratic districts. These are mostly Black and Latino districts. Uh, they unpack some of the most Republican districts. They make uh, more Republican districts, 10% uh, between 10% and 30% uh, Republican, but they're not over 40% Republican, and they're certainly not between five uh, or 10% Republican and 10% Democratic. There are almost no competitive districts in the proposed uh, Texas redistricting plan. Um, and since uh, race and party are very highly correlated in Texas, uh, this, this means that they packed uh, Blacks and Hispanics uh, much more than they were packed before. And they created a lot of districts in which Blacks and Hispanics are relatively small minorities and have no chance to elect anybody. Um, there are two um, bills before Congress right now. Uh, the S-1 that has uh, been proposed is not the original S-1. Uh, it passes H-1 in the House and went over to the Senate became S-1. Uh, this is the bill that, uh, that Joe Manchin has uh, negotiated uh, and presumably he will vote for it, uh, though it's unclear that he would vote to end the filibuster. Uh, these are several things that it does. Uh, there are more things that it does that I just didn't put in, the, in here. Um, it requires 13 days of early voting, including weekends. So the practice of souls to the polls that a lot of black churches and some Latino churches have uh, used uh, are mandated for the whole country. Maximum 30 minutes standing in line, no ban on distributing foods and beverages, many forms of ID for in purpose and vote by mail. Uh, not just uh, the uh, a driver's license or um, in several states, uh, a concealed weapons permit. Uh, no excuse voting by mail is required everywhere. It's been banned in Texas now. With prepaid postage and permanent mail voting, if you apply for it, that's what we have in California, it makes that national. Uh, it has signature matching on voting by mail. You can't require an ID for vote by mail under this provision. Uh, the signature matches are enough. It requires drop boxes and sets up some provisions as to how many there should be. It uh, allows, it requires voting for formerly incarcerated people. You get out of jail, you can vote. Uh, rather than uh, what's the case in Florida, you have to pay your legal financial obligations in Florida, all of your legal financial obligations. And nobody has any records of those. You have to, if you want to, if you're somebody who had a felony uh, and you want to find out what legal financial obligations you still have, you have to go to 11 separate state databases, not all of which are open to the public in order to find out what you have to pay. Um, it limits purges of voters. Um, there are often purges of lists. There are 200,000 people recently purged from a list in Wisconsin. Uh, unclear whether they all are people who have died and moved away at all. This uh, makes it harder to purge and it protects election officials and, and protects voters in polling places. Uh, the Texas law, uh, particularly right now, would prohibit people from um, uh, uh, interfering with people who wanted to oversee the elections person by person. So they can look at everybody who gets checked in, they can challenge everybody. Uh, and if a local election official, polling place official wants to say, no, you're, uh, you just challenged 50 people, you're, this is just holding up the line, people are uh, leaving the line going home, uh, you gotta stop that. The election officials can be charged with a felony. Uh, or a strong misdemeanor. The uh, John Lewis Act, which puts into effect uh, the uh, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act again, um, 
it also basically overturns Brnovich. It overturns all of the guidelines. It essentially uh, applies the same standards that have been used in vote dilution cases to uh, vote denial cases. Uh, and it explicitly disapproves the Brnovich guideline, guidepost that I set up in the, in the very beginning. Um, the geographical coverage scheme uh, that is set up is uh, complicated, I think needlessly complicated. Uh, I could discuss that, but I, I'm now gone over my time. Sorry about that. Uh, let me stop and uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, ask and I'll be happy to go over anything that I didn't make clear. Okay, thank you very much. I forgot to unmute myself. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, you know, you've really sparked uh, quite a bit of interest here. <laughs> and uh, oh, so we have uh, some questions for you and hopefully we can get through most of them. Um, you know, I, I, it's really been a really highly informative uh, presentation. You're reminding us that our democracy requires a lot of active vigilance and participation. And there's a constant battle going on and raging in our courts that most of the time we don't hear about all of these things, but collectively they're actually all uh, moving toward uh, making voter suppression easier is what it sounds like to me. So I think this these laws that you uh, talked about that of course the League of Women Voters has have been really active at advocating for that, you know, are just really so important. Um, so let me get started with the first question. And that is about the Freedom to Vote Act. How, we know what it'll do for federal elections. How does that trickle down and impact state and local elections? Well, um, unless state, elections were completely divorced from federal elections, unless they were held on different days, it would have dramatic effect on, on state uh, elections and uh, local elections. There are a lot of uh, local elections which have been held on different days, but uh, they are increasingly held on the same day. Um, California is an example of that. Um, but they would certainly affect a lot of things about um, local elections, consider purges, for example, unless the state somehow can keep two separate lists of voters, uh, then purges couldn't take place that would affect the state elections without uh, being banned in general. So that would uh, be an effect. 30 minute lines, forms of voter ID, all of those things would uh, likely affect state elections. To the extent that the S-1 was passed under a constitutional justification, which included the 14th and 15th Amendments, then it would affect state and local elections entirely. Uh, to the extent that it's passed under Article 1, the Times, Places, and Manners provision, it would affect only federal elections. And so long as Congress puts in the 14th Amendment and the 15th Amendment, then it has an equal effect on state as, and local as well as the federal elections. Okay, yes, because I know that in California, our legis state legislature has been really good about uh, you know, putting in laws to have concurrent elections. Uh, it reduces the cost and, and simplifies the fact that people don't have to be waking up every five minutes, especially for local elections. A lot of people don't hear that there is even a local election going on, let alone, you know, really getting involved in it. So in the state of California, it's great. But that's where my concern is about states where state legislatures can just turn around and, you know, just set up different voting uh, systems, but cost hopefully would be prohibitive, you know, and to go ahead and, and you know, have that number of elections, but I guess they'd rather pay for that than to give people their voting rights. You know, I had a question about section five that allowed for pre-clearance. You mentioned that it was struck down by the Supreme Court in the Shelby versus Holder decision in 2013. 
I, my question is kind of, I don't know how this impacts the Freedom to Vote Act, but if, uh, or the uh, John Lewis Voting Rights Act, but let's assume that that hadn't been struck down. Between 2016 and 2020, we had a Sessions Bar DOJ. So absent that 2013 decision, can you speculate what DOJ would have done about discriminatory practices? Are we still going to be um, subject to uh, a DOJ that may or may not decide to take something up? Well, it's true that uh, the Trump administration's DOJ was uh, completely inactive in voting rights, but that had not been the case under Republican jurisdiction, uh, under Republican administrations in the past. Um, if you think back to uh, the graph over time, uh, if you actually looked at the years, uh, you would find that the most active period of voting rights uh, cases was during the Reagan administration. And the Reagan Justice Department was actually pretty good on voting rights. Uh, there were a great many uh, career staff who were dedicated to voting rights. And uh, even so, the political appointee that uh, in the Reagan administration uh, and the, the Ford administration before that, that uh, were in charge, uh, were either sympathetic to voting rights or willing to go along uh, when they got their arms twisted on this. That was true in the Nixon administration as well, which uh, followed the Southern strategy and was in general anti-voting rights. Um, so, there is uh, reason to believe that uh, Republican administrations will, most Republican administrations have enforced uh, voting rights. Um, but what would have happened otherwise? Um, the, the Texas voter ID case uh, that I was in was, was brought before the District Court of the District of Columbia and the, that court had decided in 2013, early 2013, that uh, the Texas voter ID law was uh, a violation of section five. And uh, immediately after Shelby County versus Holder, two hours after Shelby County versus Holder came down, Texas uh, said, well, that case, that decision no longer holds. We will start the voter. We we'll start using voter ID immediately, and the Supreme Court uh, suspended, overturned the uh, district court, uh, district of Columbia's decision to take the voter ID case because it said that Section Five no longer applies. Um, so, if uh, no Shelby County versus Holder, then we would have uh, won that case. Um, I think. Uh, it was a strong case. I think it could have been won on intent issues, but the DC District Court decided to go entirely on, uh, on effect, um, made it entirely an effect decision. Um, and there would have been similar cases in voter ID uh, all throughout the country. The same thing happened in North Carolina. The afternoon of the Shelby County versus Holder, the head of the redistricting, uh, the, uh, voting uh, committee, the elections committee in the North Carolina state legislature said, okay, we can now go with the big bill. So the big bill had not only voter ID, it also had a great many other provisions. And I testified in that case as well. And uh, we would have won that case if uh, it, it would have been denied preclearance under section five, either by the DOJ or District Court of the District of Columbia. The whole history of the United States from uh, 2011 to 2020 would have been dramatically changed in voting laws had Shelby County and Rogers Holder not been decided the way they were. Yes, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, you feel like you're at the mercy of people who who have the, the, the responsibility for maintaining or um, uh, upholding our laws. And that's where we, you know, obviously, um, 
our vigilance is, is necessary because not all of them, you know, take up um, the, the, the burdens of their office uh, with equal fervor, you know. So uh, one of the next questions is about the burden of proof concept. You indicated that um, one of the five guidelines, I think, that were established um, in that court case, I, I, Veronovich, or I, I don't remember how to pronounce the name, that, uh, that they had shifted the burden of proof, my understanding is? No, if I get that impression, I, I was, that was wrong. Um, they, they didn't shift the burden of proof. The burden of proof in a Section 2 case has always been on plaintiffs. Um, what they said was one of the things that ought to be taken into account is how severe the burden is. Uh, how difficult does the particular provision make it to vote? Um, and the Ninth Circuit thought that the burden on particularly Native Americans in the ballot collection provision of the Arizona state law was quite great. Uh, if you have to drive uh, 40 miles to put your ballot in a, uh, in a mailbox or deposit it in a post office, that that is a considerable uh, burden. When, uh, when I was doing the Texas voter ID case, um, one of the contentions was that um, if you had to get an ID in Texas, uh, they, you very often had to drive uh, for round trip a couple of hundred miles to a Department of Motor Vehicles office in another county. And the question was whether that was a great burden and I remember the lawyers for Texas saying, uh, well, this is not a great burden for Texans. We always, we often drive a couple hundred miles. We don't think of anything of driving a couple hundred miles uh, to get a taco. Um, and uh, it seems to me, I mean, there are a lot of people who don't have cars, okay? Uh, there is no public transportation in rural areas or small towns in a lot of these states. Uh, in Alabama, in the voter ID, uh, after they passed the voter ID, they closed the Department of Motor Vehicles in over 20 counties. So you had to go to the next county to get uh, a voter ID uh, or a, uh, an identification uh, requirement, an identification card. And those cards, the ones that they closed were disproportionately in the areas that were majority black, the counties that were majority black. Uh, wow, I'm really surprised by that. Um, I remember Hillary Clinton, Clinton campaigning in uh, 2016 in Alabama, talking about that. Um, and it was, uh, I think, fairly egregious. Right. Um, I, I think, you know, I think I remember something about Kentucky, one where they closed the, the voting place that that they had established um, only one outside of town and people were had no transportation out there. I forgot what it was in a city of 2000. And it's just really atrocious, you know. Uh, we were wondering if there's anything that we in California can do to oppose voter suppression in Texas or, you know, Georgia or Alabama or some other place. Well, I think the best thing is, um, and I, I think the California representatives, uh, the, the fact that Padilla was the Secretary of State, he's ultra concerned and very, very well, uh, very knowledgeable about all sorts of voting practices. Uh, and it's wonderful to have a Secretary of State uh, in, in Congress to tell people, this is how it really works. I know, because I've been doing this nuts and bolts of this for uh, a long time. But I think that the local representatives, local members of Congress in California are very uh, likely to do the right thing to you too, uh, Alan uh, and Chip um, and Napolitano. Uh, but I don't think it ever hurts to uh, 
email or write your representative and say, we're really concerned about this issue. We know that you're going to do the right thing on this issue, but we want you to know that this is really important to us. Um, but I think the most important thing that you can do is to uh, try to convince Congress in general that the passage of S1 is really important and that if that requires uh, an exception to the filibuster rule, um, then that exception ought to be carved out. Um, and I know that there are petitions that you can sign online about this, uh, but with all the stuff that's going on, with all the important things that uh, are before Congress and before the country as, as a whole, it's quite possible that Voting Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act is going to be sort of lost in the shuffle. And um, we citizens depend on league members uh, to keep calling that to the attention of people in general. You can always write a letter to the editor. You can always try to uh, ensure that uh, there is some sort of news story that's related to this. Uh, you can say, okay, in the recall, we in California, you can point out, we in California had drop boxes easily available. There were no incidents on drop boxes or very few incidents on drop boxes in California during the recall election that made it easier to vote. We in California have uh, now made it possible to have permanent absentee ballots. Absentee ballots voting by mail will be sent to every voter. There's an envelope with a uh, stamp already on it. We want everybody to have the same opportunity to participate in democracy that we have. Um, and just keep working at that. <laughs> yes, thank you. One really quick question. I don't know if you have any uh, opinion or a perspective on um, you know, enfranchising non-citizen voting in local school district elections, because my understanding is that there's really nothing, nothing in the Constitution precluding uh, people who are not uh, yet citizens from engaging in, you know, in elections, especially local ones. Well, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, there was widespread enfranchisement of non-citizens. Uh, so long as you had taken out papers uh, indicating your desire to start the process of becoming a citizen in uh, more than 20 states, you could vote. Uh, this was often used as a device to try to uh, encourage people to move to those states, uh, places that people didn't want to move, move to. I mean, if you wanted to, uh, if you want to spend the, the winter in North Dakota, uh, <laughs> Wyoming, etc. Uh, well, if you do, you get the right to vote. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is that um, there are an increasing number of people who are um, undocumented or the children of undocumented people who are in schools. And California is a quintessential example of this. Uh, if you eliminated undocumented people from LA city schools, uh, the population in LA city schools would drop by at least a third. So you've got these parents that uh, are undocumented and uh, their kids may be American citizens, born on American soil, automatic citizenship. Should they have a right to participate in the election of officers who would um, oversee what's gonna happen to their kids? That's a question that you should ask yourself about this. And if the answer is no, they shouldn't have any right to do it, then, uh, then keep people unenfranchised. Um, it's, there is a precedent in women's suffrage for the partial enfranchisement of citizens. The first sort of enfranchisement that happened to women in states that were actually in the union not uh, territories. Wyoming was the first uh, territory to enfranchise women, but it wasn't, didn't go in the union until later, uh, was so-called school suffrage. 
And the first uh, offices to which women were elected were schools. Why? Because they had kids, because they knew about what was happening to their kids. And so there was widespread school suffrage long before there was uh, suffrage in presidential elections. And uh, in the struggle for women's suffrage, uh, there was presidential suffrage in states where the majority of the presidential electors by 1916, uh, even though they couldn't vote in state elections, um, in a majority of states, women could vote in presidential elections by 1916. So this partial enfranchisement, both at the level of, quote, aliens, uh, as they were called then, uh, or women, is well established in American history as, uh, as a practice. And it could be uh, without any difficulties, not unconstitutional to do it. It's just a question of uh, local option or not. And there are some places um, that have, uh, have enfranchised people who are uh, undocumented. Um, in in uh, Montgomery County, Maryland, where Jamie Raskin is from, uh, you may have seen Jamie Raskin in, in the impeachment, uh, and Jamie Raskin is uh, a major player in Congress in uh, voting rights as well, because he's on the Judiciary Committee, and he's also on the uh, January 6th Commission Committee. He's on television on C-SPAN all the time. Uh, he was one of the major proponents of the partial enfranchisement in Montgomery County of people who uh, are undocumented. So it's been done. Uh, it's an interesting question, and you can think about it for yourself, but uh, don't think that it is unprecedented in, in the United States to do something like this. Thank you. I think that there is an effort, um, I think, in our school districts here in Pasadena, that there's uh, proponents of moving forward with something like that. And I think San Francisco has something similar. So yeah. they've, um, you know, really been looking into that. Well, we don't have any more time for any questions, but we want to thank you so much for making us aware of the work, you know, we have to do to safeguard our democracy and in particular for the work you're doing, you know, to ensure voting rights for everyone. I mean, it shouldn't be an accident. I should be able to move to any state in the union and know that my voting rights are essentially the same and uh, that I shouldn't have to be struggling. You know, people are moving around a lot. Uh, trying to make sure that they're, um, you know, they get uh, achieve some standard of living and it's easier in some places than others. And why should you lose uh, the the access to the ballot box just because you make that kind of a, a move for your family? It's just beyond me, you know. So I really want to thank you so much and hope that you will, in fact, come back and keep us informed about what's happening with voting rights. We, it's still up in the air uh, in Congress. And as you said, you know, there are so many pressures on them to take care of so many problems we have. We hope that this is not one of the things that gets lost because in fact, it will help us solve our other problems to have everyone engaged and everyone able to have their say. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay, so. It shouldn't be left just to Dr. Uh, you know, uh, my God, I keep calling him the wrong thing, uh, <laughs> uh, Kauser. To, uh, to protect our rights in the courts. Uh, it has to be done through our activism. Um, so a majority of the state legislatures, as you heard, are really working uh, to legalize voter suppression tactics all over uh, this uh, great union of ours. And uh, federal law can do a lot to stop this, uh, the, the stealing of people's access to the ballot box. So please help pass the Freedom to Vote Act, you know, and of course the John Lewis Voting Rights Act also. So I actually, I'm not saying, I'm serious, get your cell phone out right now. There's a telephone call that you need to make 
And it should be very, very easy for you to follow the script. I'm not going to necessarily, um, you know, twiddle my thumbs while you're making the phone call, but I really encourage you to do that and do it and have your friends, family, and whoever else cares about making sure that everyone has equal representation and gets an equal voice. Um, we're blessed to be in California, but that's not the case for everyone. So please uh, make sure you call. There's a script for you to follow right here. There's also on our hot topics uh, on our website at lwv-pa.org, you can go to our hot topics and there's a link there explaining what the provisions of that bill are so you can take a look at it. And uh, just, uh, you know, have your voice heard. Remember, don't let anybody kind of shut you up. <laughs> um, uh, we, you know, we have to do our part. That That is why most of us here who are in the audience are members of the League of Women Voters, right? Because it's so important for everyone to have their say. Um, so thank you very much. You have the different contact information. If you didn't get a chance to get that, again, you can email our events committee, events at lwvpa. Um, excuse me, uh, hyphen pa.org, or just our office, our league office, and we'll get that information for you so that you can send that out. Anyway, I just wanted to remind everybody that the Pasadena, that Pasadena Media has been recording the session. And so be sure uh, to go to the, our YouTube channel on our website so that you can share it far and wide to get this information out there. Uh, I want to thank our Zoom hosts, Catherine and Hester. And thank you to Dr. Kauser. That was really an enlightening um, presentation. It's um, it's. The battle wages on and it's uh, people like him who are fighting in the courts to try to make sure people get their right to vote. Uh, so again, stay informed, make sure you, um, thank you to Pasadena Media for recording this and make sure that you um, um, come back, stay informed by going to our website and please don't forget to get out there and mix it up, <laughs> get into good trouble. Thank you very much. Have a great day.